Just a quick trigger warning. This episode does talk about mental health. If you or someone you know is struggling or in a crisis, help is available 24-7. Call or text 988 or chat 988lifeline.org. We about to party. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gonna turn it up. Up. Bring the house down. Got that big space pump and make them bounce now. Flows it like they bossing and then the freaks are coming out. This is AEW Unrestricted. I'm Will Washington, and she is the one and only Aubrey Edwards. How are you doing today, Aubrey? Hello. I'm doing good. I'm so excited for today. What do we got, Will? Well, this is a very, very special episode of AEW Unrestricted. It is Mental Health Awareness Month, as a lot of you are aware, and... Talking about mental health awareness, um, I feel like that's something in professional wrestling that a lot of people don't talk enough about as far as the fan base is concerned. But it is something we are very conscious of behind the scenes in professional wrestling. And so we wanted to use this episode to really highlight our side of things and specifically Team Psych here in AEW. And we're joined by three really special guests and we're going to be joined by them throughout the show. Uh, later on, we've got my dear friend, Jim and Nika. We've got Dr. David Reese and joining us right now. Drum roll. Drum roll. <laughs> uh, we've got Chris Manzioni joining us right now. Yay! Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Chris, thanks for being with us. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Oh, man. Uh, I'm I'm just so stoked that you, like, agreed to do this, but more so stoked that I get to see you every week, even if, like, I don't have, like, a formal appointment scheduled with you. Like, that's one of the things I like most about people in the mental health space that are, like, really great is just how approachable and wonderful they are. And I think you sort of embody that. I appreciate that. You know, that part of my job is not always necessarily sitting down with somebody having a, you know, a formal session. It's, hey, running into each other in catering or in the hallway and having a small two or five minute conversation that, you know, maybe somebody says something that resonates and, and you never know what's going to stick. So, you know, every moment that we have is, is valuable. And I try to look at it that way. Well, can you share some of uh, the specific techniques or strategies you use to help wrestlers kind of manage Things like pre-match nerves or anxiety. Yeah, great question, Will. So it's not exactly, you know, a list of things to do, right? We're coming at this from a foundational standpoint, right? So what I want to do is I want to help uh, talent build self self efficacy, right? Do they believe that they can face the challenges that are ahead of them? Do they believe that they have enough to overcome those things, right? That leads toward confidence. If you have confidence, then it really doesn't matter what faces you in the future, you're going to be able to attack that head on. Um, so it's not necessarily, hey, let's work on this one technique, right, that's going to help everybody. It really is tailored to the individual and why it's so important that um, I have to get to know everybody and really build relationships because, you know, without that relationship, without trust, um, we can't have that conversational style and, and can't build those foundational uh, aspects of being an elite performer. So question I have is sort of more so for showing a little behind the scenes to our listeners, but you're on the road every week with us. And typically I think on dynamite and collision. So you're, you're there all the time. <laughs> so yeah. if there was not a, if there was a question as far as like how serious AEW takes mental health, it's like, no, we have someone on hand, like all the time, anytime you need it on the road. And even when you're not on the road, you're accessible via text or email or whatever. So it's like, you are always there for people. And I know that your background, most people don't know this, but like you previously worked with the Yankees, who is also a group of athletic performers who travel quite often. Was this the natural jump of, hey, I'm already on the road all the every time working with elite athletes? Like, let's just jump into wrestling. <laughs> yeah, Aubrey, great point. So that and it really was a very natural transition for me. Um, you know, I spent 20 years with the New York Yankees working in the clubhouse with when I was 22 years old with Derek Jeter and Alex Rodriguez and Andy Pettit. Oh, moving on great. to CC Sabathia and Mark Teixeira and then on to, you know, Aaron Judge, Giancarlo Stanton and Garrett Cole. And, you know, you're with these guys. You were really with the eras. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I spent some time there. Uh, like I was the very lucky to get, <laughs> to get 20 years in the big leagues is is uh, a rare feat. You know, even, you know, being in the clubhouse, working with those guys. Um, and I, I really got a, a firsthand taste of what it takes to be an elite performer. And not only that, but what it takes to stay there. And, you know, part of that is 162 game schedule, uh, you know, over seven or eight months, if you're lucky, every day spending time with people. So for me, the wrestling schedule, hey, dynamite on Wednesday and then uh, collision on Saturday, it, it was a natural flow for me of like, hey, 
I know how to do this. I'm pretty familiar with the culture. I'm pretty familiar with, you know, the travel and, and what it takes to maintain, you know, an elite level with all of these other things going on. So yeah, it was definitely a smoother transition for me than even I anticipated. Hey, two shows a week. That's coming from the Yankees. That's uh I would say this is child's play. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a different kind, right? It's a different yeah. kind of stress, but... Uh, I don't know. Baseball has an off-season, okay? Like, we're 52 fair. weeks a year. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. 52 weeks a year, so we're still looking at 104 shows. But on the other side of that, you're like, well, it's 182 games, like, in a much shorter amount of time. So fair. either way, uh, hats off. I, I commend you for being able to uh, jump over into the world of professional wrestling. And I think that's really cool. Thanks. I appreciate it. And it's been, it's been a great transition coming over last August and really just kind of diving in feet first and, you know, doing the work of getting to know everybody and connecting with people. And it's been an absolute blast and the talent and really, and coaches and front office staff, everyone has been so receptive um, that I didn't anticipate how quickly people would jump on board. You know, a lot of times there can be a stigma attached with psychology, even sports psychology, right? The work that I'm doing is more the strength and conditioning of the psych world, right? Not necessarily the heavy work of, you know, clinical stuff. So even with that, there's a stigma there. And I fully anticipated that it would take maybe almost a year for people to really start getting comfortable with me, but it, it happened <laughs> it like almost immediately. <laughs> Uh, I love it. Well, I suppose uh, a major question I, I wanted to, to throw out there then is the differences uh, that you've noticed between, you know, the, the types of performers professional wrestlers are and how you've had to adjust your strategies in that regard. I will say I thought the same thing coming in, right? Of like, okay, how am I going to tailor this to a really unique group of athletes, right? Where, hey, professional wrestling is a is a is a just a different mix, right? Of there's a lot of other stuff that goes into than just the in-ring product. But what I discovered is, hey, look, at its core base, athletes are athletes, right? And there hasn't been, there, I will say there are more similarities than differences between professional baseball players and professional wrestlers. Really? Huh? That's, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that because it's one of those things that's like, not only are we athletes, but we're also performers at the same time. So it's kind of approaching it from those, those two perspectives a little bit. I don't know. I, I don't know how much of a performer Jeter is, but I'm just <laughs> assuming. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and, you know, I worked for the Yankees, but also I did other work outside of baseball as well. I, you know, I worked with Broadway actors and I've worked with country music stars. And so people that, you know, that's why it's, it's not necessarily sports psychology, it's performance psychology, right? Because you want to uh -huh. perform at whatever you're doing. And I just kept noticing a lot of similarities that, you know, foundationally, you know, whether you're playing a song in front of 60,000 people or, you know, trying to get, get a walk or a base hit in a big spot in the World Series or, you know, coming into all in in the main event and, you know, wanting to knock it out of the park, a lot of the foundational principles remain the same. And um, that was an interesting discovery for me. And it, it really helped me kind of put things into overdrive as I was able to, to jump in as people got comfortable with me. Then we were able to sit down and really, you know, work on some stuff, which is, has been great. So I'm kind of curious because there's, it's not just go to work every week and perform on TV and all these sort of things. There's also different stages of being a performer. There's the mental burnout. There's the rehabbing an injury. Like, are there different ways that you approach all of these different, I guess, states of being? Yeah, a hundred percent. Great question, Aubrey. Yes. So uh, what I'm discovering is a lot of the work that I'm doing is with rehab and what we can we call return to play protocol, right, that our team medical has. And, and I'm really involved in that. And, uh, you know, when somebody gets hurt, that can be a really difficult mental struggle as much as physical struggle, right? And especially if you have a long period of time coming back, there are things that your, your mind plays tricks on you. You feel left out. Uh, maybe some anxiety creeps in, right? Maybe a little bit of depression creeps in of feeling like you're stuck and the world's passing you by and, and the world of professional wrestling is passing you by. So uh, I've been really involved in our talent that are rehabbing and helping them develop their mindset and ensure that they you know, have a positive outlook going forward so that when they're ready to come back, they're ready to hit the ground running at 100%, not just physically, but also mentally. And so also just talking about uh, the aspect of being able to come back and things like that and talking about being on the road as much as we are, how do you manage, and this kind of goes across the board because you've been managing it all forever, um, but how do you manage things like burnout? How do you manage things like the fatigue of it all? Because at the end of the day, we're performing, uh, or our stars are performing for 
but 100 shows per year. And so just thinking about how much and how much of a toll that can take and how much having to maintain things like being over with the crowd and whatnot, how do you help the talent manage that kind of fatigue? Yeah. So, you know, when we're talking about managing fatigue, right, first step is self-awareness you know, being aware of what's going on physically and mentally noticing things, right? Like, wow, I'm having a different attitude coming to work today than I normally have, or my routine isn't helping me the same way that it's helped me in the past. Uh, you know, what's going on here, right? So, <laughs> uh, you know, for first those not watching the video, and I'm like pointing at myself, because this is specifically <laughs> something that you and I have talked about in our meetings. Yes, absolutely, right is, you know, uh, are you working for your routine? Or is your routine working for you and acknowledging that and, and finding where the line is, you know, is that first step. And then once you acknowledge, hey, I think I'm experiencing some burnout, then it's all right, what do we have to do to recenter yourself, bring you back to, you know, where you're comfortable being your best, right. And it's coming back to your values, coming back to your principles, coming back to your goals, and resetting your recentering yourself there which, you know, again, depending on the person, there's a lot of different ways to get there, right? It's, it, it's very much uh, independent of, of who you're talking to. And, and finding those things and reconnecting with that a lot of times can be what helps you get through that. And look, burnout's burnout, right? So sometimes you just need a break. And sometimes they, the recommendation is, hey, I just need a couple of weeks off or I need to take a step back because the physical part of it is real as well. So it's just a matter of you know being aware of it and then having the courage to take action on that. Oh, man, I just love the, your mindset and how you approach all of this. So as we're sort of wrapping up here, what advice do you have for aspiring wrestlers who sort of want to develop that mental resilience and psychological skills for success in this industry? Oof, good question. So I'm biased, but my first piece of advice would be go find uh, somebody who works in my field. Go find a mental performance coach. Go talk to somebody and let them help you, right? When we want to get physically fit, you can go get a personal trainer and they're going to help you get physically ready to go, right? On the mental side, Go find a mental performance coach. They're going to help you get better, right? And sometimes hearing something from the outside, hearing it from somebody else who's trained in this field, something will just click, right? Or you'll hear something that you hadn't considered before, uh, and that can really help you take the next step. Uh, no, seriously, Chris, thank you for being here with us. This has been a pleasure and a genuinely eye-opening conversation for me. And I think anybody, I know AEW talent listens to this podcast and anybody who is listening to this definitely take advantage of all of the tools that are available to you in AEW and uh, for any of the fans listening I hope this conversation here gave you a, some better insight as to things that are happening in our company we've still got so much more to come um, but seriously Chris thank you for being here yeah Will Aubrey thank you so much for having me it's awesome I love being able to talk about this stuff and I'm so happy that you guys are you know honoring uh, mental health awareness month and, and putting this out there for everyone it's been great it's just so awesome thank you for chatting us with us today we've got more coming up on unrestricted we've got more members of team psych we want to highlight during mental health awareness month coming up AEW Unrestricted, we're back. It's Aubrey and Will, and uh, this Mental Health Awareness Month edition of AEW Unrestricted continues with AEW's Team Psych, and we couldn't have Team Psych without uh, a dear friend of mine, actually, uh, and a friend that actually goes back before AEW, and it was funny what? because we started around the same time, and it was like this kind of race between the two of us to see <laughs> who was going to like get their offer first, uh, yeah. and... <laughs> Uh, so that this was like conversation that was taking place all throughout. It's actually been about a year, right? Because yeah, uh, yeah I got my offer April twentieth of last year. You beat year. me. The answer yeah. is you beat oh. me. Yeah, uh, I got <laughs> I got my final offer on the twenty eighth, which is this weekend, Sunday. Yeah. Uh, well, it's Jim and Ika Eborn. Um, and yeah, I, I I remember all of those conversations taking place, and it was around the same time. So we've both been in AEW about a year. You've been a part of Team Psych for about a year. But Jim, give us a little background on what you do in AEW and what you do in general. Whew. Okay, let's let's do a full rounded thing. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my background has been mental health in all capacities. I started studying psychology at the age of 16 because I, I always tell folks, and I, I like to be honest, and I think as practitioners, there is a balance of like showing who you are and like also keeping a bay. Um, I like to be upfront. I am a child of trauma, which led me into working in trauma. 
Um, outside of AEW, I predominantly do a lot of work with sexual assault survivors under my own company. I teach, I write, I speak, I do tons of educational things. Um, I have a nonprofit for sexual assault survivors. I co-own an intimacy coordination company called Sintima, where we train uh, intimacy coordinators predominantly online. I work in true crime with my friend Lenora, where we support uh, stalking survivors, which is wild. And I work at AEW, which is where I always say, out of Team Psych, I get to do like the real things that people get nervous about. I'm like, if you think we can't handle it, I'm that person. Um, so I like to focus on sex, relationships, body things, anger, communication, finding balance between life and work, kind of like being able to take a breather, getting into your body, those kind of fun things. So you might see me in the back throwing ice with someone. You might see me running back and forth trying to sit on floors. I have a bag of fidget toys that I pass out all every time I'm on site. I'm kind of just all over and I think that's fun. So it's funny because as you say, like the the balance of things, like immediately I think about social media because it's this awesome thing as far as like promoting who you are and all the things that you care about, but it's also an awful thing sure. because of all the things we know about social media. So is and I know that one of the things that's great about you is you make yourself so visible on social media and you talk about these things that are so important to you in all the different things that you do. How do you help kind of our, our talent navigate the the negative and the uh, psychological impact of social media on your mental well-being? Yeah, honestly, it's one of my favorite things that I said out loud. People are like, that sounds easier than it is, Jim. And I said, I know. But reality testing, I think that there's the idea of, is this real? In Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, none of that is real. And there's a lot of parasocial relationships that happen for folks and folks that don't know what that means. There's people on the internet that will see you and be like, we're best friends. I love this person. I will ride and die. And you see literally violence and threats online. Yeah, A lot of professional wrestling fandom is built on parasocial relationships. Absolutely. And it's, it's something that I've really been struggling to grasp over the last, especially year of, of seeing it transpire. But I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it's totally fine. Um, I think there's the reminder of that isn't real. And so these people's thoughts, I, I will ask folks questions, does their thoughts matter? And the response is like, well, they're fans. And I'm like, but this is one person on the internet. Does that person matter? You're upset because they don't like the way you did a 450 splash. Will they ever do one in life? No. Are they ever <laughs> going to be in your job? No. Are you the one with the contract and are amazing and are doing this work? Yes. Also, let's get off the internet for a little bit. Um, yes. And so I think there's the reminder of like, we need the internet for promotion and all of these things, but also like wrestlers are characters. Leave that there. Go focus and do real life things. Go outside, drink some tea. When's the last time you took a deep breath? Because we're all walking around holding our breath. Like, I like to get back into like the reality of things and go, it doesn't matter. Of course, folks will spiral and go back and forth and be like, well, Jim, this is the thing. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. It's okay. Like you, you are allowed to leave that at home. And I think there's also the reminder of you are not your job 24 seven. God damn that's, yes. that's such a tough one. <laughs> I just sure. Uh, well, you know, I, I want to talk about, um, you know, let, let, let's kind of stay on the topic of self care, right? Because, uh, that's really, I think in general, what a lot of people kind of struggle with because we do feel like we are a job 24 seven. And especially in a, a professional wrestling role where it never really turns off, right? Like, you know, we have our shows Wednesday, we have our show Friday, we have our show Saturday, and we have Ring of Honor on Thursdays. And so we have like shows constantly running, but then we constantly have people talking about it and talking to us about it. And we're constantly planning. And so what are some of the tools that, that you kind of coach people with uh, as far as getting them to employ in their own lives to make sure that they can disconnect at some point in this 24 seven world that is professional wrestling? Mm, I love this question. So I think if we look at it, the idea of self care is what people know so often and we'll all talk about it, but there's also the idea of self soothing. And so you need both of them to be a full human. So let me talk through self care. It's not just going to the spa and getting massages, although that's really important for some people like myself. It's did you take your medication? Mm -hmm. How many hours have you slept? 
Have you been outside? Have you spent time with someone that just genuinely loves you? Like, those are the things. So (laughs) self-care is the things that keep us afloat. Did you eat today? Like, are we on a meal plan? Do we need to check in? Do you need to cry? Like, these are the things that I find are like (laughs) self-care and they're not bad things. And they don't also have to be like super grander. If you're like, let's go to the spa, cool. But also like, did you need to like stretch? Do you need to like go lift some weights or do something? And then there's the self-soothing aspect, which is how I became a wrestling fan, I think, at the age of nine is like the things that allow our brains to just shut off. And it's like, for some folks, as we know, people walk around video games in the back. Mm-hmm. They're listening to music. They're, they're just like sitting with their friend and catching up. That can be self-soothing because you are just existing. Sometimes we don't need to be active. Sometimes the hardest part is just sitting still and being quiet for a little bit. And so finding the balance of all of those things can be tricky. One of the questions I like to ask folks, and they always go, what? What brings you joy? Yep. Like, it's not a hard question, but because we all get so wrapped up in just existing and making it, when I ask what brings people joy, they go, I don't, I don't remember, or I don't know, or I just focus on my family. And so often I'm like, well, let's figure out what brings you joy. Let's go through some things. When's the last time you laughed? When's the last time you smiled? When's the last time you like laughed till you like cried and your belly ached? And so I'll start kind of navigating and asking those questions. I'm like, I know it seems like I'm just trying to be in your business, which I might be. And then they'll laugh. But also, Aubrey knows this. I I said this when I did the heels call. If you're laughing, you're breathing. If you're breathing, you're present. So oftentimes when I work with folks, I am also ensuring that there, there is laughter. Because that way I know that we are aware. And also it lets your guard down a little bit. You're not going to be mad at me while you're laughing. Unless you're, you know, special. But for the <laughs> most part, like it allows you to exist to go, okay, now I can think about these things. And so I think there's just finding your balance and knowing that you're allowed to like opt in and opt out of things. And that just because it works for Aubrey, it doesn't work for Will. You can share information and go, this doesn't work. And anytime anyone works with me, I always say, I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff. I love a follow-up email so people don't feel overwhelmed. I'm like, I'll send you things. Take what works for you and leave the rest. Don't feel overwhelmed to try and do everything because it might not be for you. And I think that also allows folks to go, oh, yeah, I also get to choose what works for me. Like, oh, yeah, I have choice. I get to consent to things. So then it's like my expansion into teaching them other tools by just focusing on the self-care and the self-soothing. It's a trick, yeah. (laughs) I love how you approach this with humor because that's so absolutely true. Like it's mental health is such a heavy thing. And oftentimes we do talk about heavy stuff that's happening in our lives or has happened. Like you mentioned trauma and all this sort of stuff, but it just becomes so much easier to talk about it when you're laughing. And that's always one of the things that I appreciate chatting with you because Oftentimes, even if we have like a five minute conversation, I'm going to end up laughing. <laughs> sure. I got to make sure you're there. Right. It's, it's, and, and the laughing as breathing thing is so smart. I love it. So you had mentioned a little bit when we started talking, sort of like your approach to mental health and the things that you like to focus on when looking at all of our AEW talent. But how do you collaborate with the other members of Team Psych and with, you know, coaches, trainers, all that sort of stuff? How do you come in to help sort of the holistic approach? of talent development. Yeah. I mean, I'm constantly in conversation with Dr. Reese. I always say Dr. Reese is like my partner in crime, which is very interesting that my partner is a 17, 72 year old little man, which just makes (laughs) sense for my future apparently. Um, And so we are constantly navigating what tools are you giving them? And did it work? If it didn't work, let me go into my bag and offer something else. And then when I see Chris, like we go back and forth, like, well, what, what were you, who are you saying? Do you think I need to follow up with them? And I think the cool part is that I work with a team of folks that understands what I do and who I am, which is very helpful. And so they can go, you know, I think you should go talk to Jim. That might be a better fit for you. And I think the honesty of this work is really good. Like I don't work with folks that are trying to just counsel everyone because fun fact, it's hard. Like you might see team psych walking around smiling and doing everything. But also knowing we have jobs outside of this as well. And so we also have to maintain our mental health. So I think being honest and not necessarily like a world that's always so honest, right? 
being honest and being true, I think has been very helpful to be able to work in this aspect of AEW and just allowing folks to see that we are humanistic, that we aren't just robots. We aren't just making things up and throwing it at people. I'm like, oftentimes when you see, I, you will never see me in like an AEW mental health shirt. That's just not who I am. And so, which also allows for confusion. But I think meeting people where they are has allowed us to be very engaged with individuals. Now, do I have to stop people and wrangle them? Like, hi, I have worked here a year. Have we met? We haven't met. Okay, let's have this conversation. But Team Psych in general, we are on the phone all the time. We are texting. Like, can, you're on a walk. Let's talk while you're on a walk. You're in your car. Let's talk while in your car. What are you reading? And also sharing information of like updated things in the world. As mental health is evolving, I think it's also important for us to know what's happening so we can share that information. There's a lot of folks that are anti-psych support, and I know it and I see you. I see you avoiding me. But I think it's also because there's such a stigma around it, right? There's a stigma specifically in wrestling where if you tell me something's going on, I'm going to go tell TK and you're going to be out of the job. And I always like to note that that is untrue, especially in AEW. We don't report to anybody outside of us unless it is we need to get you a higher level of care support or if Doc Sampson needs to know something. And even sharing information, if we don't need to tell the other person like big things, we don't. We want it to be very safe and secure for you as well. And so that's the reminder. Whatever you tell us, we keep it in-house. We're not telling the other wrestlers. We're not going in the locker rooms like announcements. Let me tell you what Aubrey told me today. Like, it's not real, (laughs) right? And so that, those are answering your question in long form. Those are kind of some of the things that I do. Uh, And I always recommend to people, uh, literally, uh, you've been witness to it, where I was sitting there having a conversation and somebody (laughs) was really breaking down and you had just happened to be walking by and I was like, you know who this is really the right conversation for? And I pulled you right in and uh, I walked by like- like, okay, bye. (laughs) Yeah, and I I walked by like an hour and a half later and you guys were still talking. And I was like, this is exactly it. This was exactly what I want to see more of. And it's so great to see that in our company and- I just love having you around. It's always yes. always exciting when I know you're going to be at TV or a pay-per-view or anything to that effect. And it was great even knowing you beforehand. And either way, thank you for being here on Unrestricted. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. God, this was so great. Oh, man. We've got one more guest from Team Psych coming up. Jiminika kind of mentioned a little bit, Dr. Reese. I'm I'm super excited. We've we've uh, I'm so happy we get to promote all of our members of Team Psych here, Mental Health Awareness Month. Stay tuned, AEW Unrestricted. AEW Unrestricted. It is Mental Health Awareness Month. Aubrey and Will are chatting with all of the members of Team Psych because AEW really values mental health. And I'm so, so stoked today to have Dr. David Reese as a part of this conversation. And Dr. Reese, I, I've worked with you on multiple occasions, and I believe you are our first member of Team Psych to join AEW. Is that correct? I believe, I think I was the first person approached, yes. Yeah, because I remember talking to Doc Sampson initially, like, hey, we should really get some people involved in this because it's not just, you know, we've talked about it a little bit already. Like, it's not the physical aspects of, you know, the job, but also the mental aspects. So, talk about sort of how you had come into AEW and what were sort of the focuses that you wanted to, you know, really drive home when building sort of Team Psych from the ground up? My background, I've been around the wrestling industry for about 20 years, but I've done sports medicine since medical school. So I'm not an athlete. I have no talent myself, but I've always been on the outskirts of it. And also for, uh, it's been over 15 years now, I've done a lot of work on the East Coast. I was back and forth for the pandemic and I connected with Chris Nowinski and the concussion Institute and I did a lot of pro bono work for them as an advisor. And then I got a call, I think it was October of 21 from Chris saying, hey, AEW is thinking of having a shrink on staff. Are you interested? Hey, that sounds neat to me. So we we started actually on a case by case basis just to see we had no idea what to expect in terms of volume or types of issues or what. Uh, and then I formally came on as a staff member January of 2022, and I'm still here as far as I know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, my focus has been a bit more clinical. Uh, and obviously, I come from a different demographic, a different background. 
my strengths are different than Jim's strengths, uh, and I make no bones about it. Uh, and my demographics are obviously different. I make no bones about that. But, you know, basically we started just on the sense of what do people need and what can we do to help them? And it was unclear whether it would be more of an EAP model of, you know, see me two or three times, then use your insurance or continuing therapy. But it turned out people like to talk to someone who understands the business, who can connect. So right now I'm just working with people for whatever they need, whether it be counseling, whether it be more depth therapy, judiciously medication at times. You know, Jim is better than I am at some of the behavioral immediate stuff so that I definitely refer people. We work together on that. We refer people to each other. Uh, and I'm a little bit more formal and a lot older. And so I sort of keep a little bit more in the background. And uh, actually, I had been on social media. I know you brought that up um, until basically until Twitter became X or Y or Z, whatever it is. And then I <laughs> said goodbye. Good and I call. Like 30, Just 000. a great call. Good, yeah. good, good. <laughs> I, I mean, I had like 30,000 followers, which isn't bad for an old shrink. I mean, that's, <laughs> but I just said, you know, I don't need that. So uh, now I'm very limited in terms of that type of issue, but I'm well aware of the toxicity of that. And we're dealing with that all the time. So we're dealing with acute issues. I deal a lot with also post-injury issues, chronic pain, concussions, but we also deal with just life, relationships, developmental issues, family issues, whatever people want to come to and talk about, we're here to work with it. You know, and at times it goes into clinical anxiety, depression, PTSD. At times it's more general, but it's basically whatever. And I just want to reinforce what I know Jim said is what we do is totally confidential. I mean, if there's something medical that Doc Sampson needs to know about, we communicate on that, obviously. Uh, but otherwise, no one in AEW knows who I see or what I talk about. All I send is the number of sessions that I've had in a month, but not who or what or why. Can you kind of give our fans a little bit of uh, some insight as to uh, the psychological impact that pain and physical injury can have on mental health? Uh, it's complex. And, you know, obviously just in general, it causes stress uh, and discomfort. You also get into issues of job security. You get, into, you know, how is this going to affect my future? And we're basically dealing with people who are in chronic pain. You know, one of the things I ask people is, when was the last day you woke up and you weren't in pain? And the typical answer I get is, it was sometime in high school. You know, and you add to that concussion issues, interpersonal issues, everything else, and you're juggling all of these different issues at the same time. You know, and obviously some people have a history of anxiety or depression or different types of issues that they bring to them. And, and sometimes being in the industry is a way of working through those issues, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in not such a good way. And we try to say, okay, how can we make this work that's best for you? And just uh, sort of adding to some of what Jim talked about in terms of self-care, one of the things that I focus on, which is, sort of the same but a little bit different is self-compassion and particularly compassion for what we went through as kids and what we went through as young adults and the other thing i deal with people a lot is you know you always well, what people tell me it's not, not my experience is you went through years waiting to make it to this point expecting that this would be shangri-la and now it turns out there's a whole bunch of, of stress that goes along with success. And success is not easy, and it's more difficult to handle, and you don't have as much control. You know, it's not like in the Indies where you could just say, oh, I'm not going to take any dates for a couple of weeks. You know, so it gets very complex, and we're often dealing with multiple issues at once. I think people forget about that fact that there's the physical pain aspect to it, right? Because we see wrestling as a performance a lot of times, but it, yeah, like I woke up today, like in incredible amount of pain. I popped a rib out in just the, the most recent show. And it's like the things you don't really think about and how that sort of plays into it. So 
talk about sort of the the psychological impact when we're going through all of this sort of physical pain. The physical pain that you're not me, but that people are experiencing, but it's also coworkers, peers, friends. I mean, this isn't MMA, this isn't boxing, and not trying to take the head off the person you're working with, you're trying to work with them. So there are also issues of responsibility, of guilt, of maintaining relationships that are really unique to this form of sports. And this for and is it sports? Obviously it's sports. You know, I mean, sure, maybe the win loss record isn't what counts like in baseball, but obviously it's it's a very high risk sport. And like I tell people, it's a damn difficult job. It's it's not easy, it's difficult, it's difficult physically, it's difficult mentally, it's difficult travel wise. Uh, and a lot of times as I say, people, well, I've made it, so things should be easy. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. One of the things I, I've genuinely been curious about is when you have talent that's not necessarily taking advantage of the tools that are available to them, the tools that are at their disposal in AEW or in professional wrestling in general, how do you personally know what signs to look for? And how do you go about encouraging somebody to take those steps? It's not easy. <laughs> Uh, um, I've been involved in the industry and in sports in general uh, long enough that I remember the days where if you mentioned mental health, your place on the roster dropped or you were fired or you were ignored, whether that be baseball or football or wrestling. Uh, and the, the stigma was very real. Uh, when I first started giving some talks for Cauliflower Alley Club, they were very concerned that talking about mental health would be negative or open them up to some type of litigation or lawsuit. I mean, now that's changed. It's been 15 some odd years, but that's where we start. And uh, and it's not totally gone. I mean, I think AEW does an excellent job, you know, in terms of providing care. In terms of communication, that's still difficult. It would be nice if people read emails, <laughs> but that doesn't happen all that often. Sorry. And again, yeah, using humor is part of it. And we need to do a better job. Uh, we're actually trying to put together some more outreach, such as just connecting with anyone who's had an injury or anyone who's out for personal reasons, family reasons. Not to say they need therapy or need treatment or have a mental health issue, but just, hey, we're here. Do you want to chat? Even if it's an informal chat. You know, are you having issues with people you're working with? Do you want to come in and just like a couple of us just informally chat, not in terms of group therapy or anything? So we need to do better with some of that. And we have some ideas how we can. But if you look, this all started less, less than three years ago. So I think we're in a pretty good place for where we started. But there's definitely room for improvement. One of the things that I absolutely love is as talent is having these positive experiences with team psych everyone's sort of talking about hey you should go talk to this person you should go talk to this person like i've literally had conversations in the locker room with other people saying dude you have not talked to dr reese yet like please go like it's a huge benefit like he understands wrestling like i don't think people understand how yeah. big of a deal that is like i've been to mental health professionals and i try to describe a little bit of what i do at work and they just it goes over their head and they just don't get right. it and the first time we chatted, I was like, hey, I want to talk about this particular instance that happened. And you're like, oh, yeah, no, I saw it. And I'm like, oh, we just cut out like 30-minute discussion. This is great. <laughs> right. And we got, yeah. we got down to like the root of the issue, and it was awesome. And I appreciate it so much. One of the things that Jim sort of talked about in our last segment was how team psych works together. Because uh, you all have different backgrounds. You all have different demographics. Like Chris is on the road all the time. So you and Jim are available at, at, at different moments. Like everyone's available outside of work. How do you sort of fit into the, the makeup of Team Psych? You know, I work mostly remotely. That's what I've been doing since the pandemic. I like to be on site now and then. But, you know, it's just not my personality to be as... I'm not Jim. I don't pretend to be. And I... <laughs> We need we need that, but that's not my thing. So I I show up a couple times a year, usually at the major pay per view. I'll be in Vegas, uh, so people know I'm not an avatar. But basically, I work remotely and having sessions. And 
because I'm aware of the schedule of AEW and my schedule's more limited these days, you know, I can be available. Well, I'm on the West Coast, so I can be available evenings for people on the East Coast. Uh, I can be available weekends. So it, it works pretty well that way. In terms of referrals, most of the people who come to me, as you say, are, hey, so-and-so told me, you know, you're not that scary. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yes. and no, I'm not that scary. I mean, the only time I've been in a ring is to make an announcement. And luckily, I didn't get pile-driven. <laughs> but, there you go. But... You know, I, but I've been around the industry. You don't need to explain terms to me. You don't need to explain to me how it works. But I make no pretense that I know what it's like to actually be in there competing. I don't pretend to. You know, at heart, I'm a mock. But I understand what's going on. And we don't have to spend time. Oh, yeah, what do you really mean by that? What, you know, I don't get that. Yeah, I mean, I think I get it pretty much, and I'm not afraid to ask when I don't get it. And I actually have a couple of people who I know from outside the industry, some of them retired, some still active in the Indies, who I'll turn to at times when, like, hey, you know, explain this to me, explain that to me, so that I have a better idea of what it's really like not having been there myself. It's like a continuing education, but for wrestling. It it's is. like, hey, so like, like let's talk about this kind of thing. Like what's happening in the industry nowadays? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I've had contact with the indies. I've never worked for WWE. I know a lot of the people there, but I try to keep up with what's going on and no, not in the industry in general, as well as just the storylines, the interactions, just to have an understanding of what's happening. You know, I wish I could say I get to watch every show. I can't, but I try to. <laughs> I can't even watch every show. So there you go. <laughs> I have to watch every show. So uh, that's, that's, true. <laughs> that's true. part of your job. Well, one of the last things I wanted to ask you, you used standard psychology. Um, you used a standard psychology test and gave it to a couple of wrestlers and you had them take it as themselves, as a heel and as a baby face. And uh, I kind of want to talk about the results of this because uh, this is, again, something that really somebody only who understands professional wrestling would even attempt to think to do. And so kind of talk about the results of that. Yeah, that, that's interesting you bring that up. That was, uh, boy, that was about 10 years ago that I did that. And it was with Cauliflower Alley Club. And I just thought of that. I thought, you know, let me see what would happen if I administered psych testing and just a standard MCMI, we call it. And I said, you know, take it as yourself, take it with your mindset of your favorite baby face and take it with your mindset of your favorite heel. Theoretically, the one taken as yourself should have come back as accurate. And the ones taken as somebody else should have come back as inaccurate, as not reliable. But these people are so good at what they do, all three came back reliable, mm. which was very, because then we were able to integrate both on a psychological level. Okay, where is this coming from? Are there issues you have from your past that can contribute to your being able to do this, but maybe have a negative effect in other ways? And that's where I do some of the deeper psychological work. But also that what I was doing at that time was to help people develop, well, where would you be best? You know, and obviously things fluctuate and people make turns and swerves. And But, you know, where is your strength? Is it being the face? Is it being the heel? And it was very interesting. I haven't done that recently because right now I'm working more clinically. But it totally shocked me when it threw out all of the theory and all three results came back as accurate. Oh my God. That's, that's hilarious and wonderful. And I kind of want to do it myself. Like, <laughs> <You're glad to. laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. I might, I might be giving you a text after this just to just see like, Hey, let's, uh, let's set that up. Let's see what happens. Oh my God. Thank you so much for meeting with us today, Dr. Reese. This was so great. Well, just to add one other thing real quickly. Sure. I do deal with medications very conservatively and there I do coordinate with Doc Sampson when need be, but there's a place for that. You know, obviously, you don't want to use anything that's going to interfere with performance or anything else, and we have to be careful. Uh, but that's something that I do offer very cautiously, very judiciously, whether someone's been on meds in the past. And I'll say one more thing. Most athletes hate antidepressants because they make mm -hmm. you too flat. 
So a lot of times I'm thinking out of the box and doing things that may not be standard psychiatry, but if they work, they work. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to knock success. Yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. If it's yeah. safe and it works, that's what we're aiming for. I, I just love that we were able to have all three of you on today to talk about kind of the different aspects and the different approach to mental health when it comes to athletes, performers, people who basically exist on the road, and then all of the aspects of that, like the outside life, the the dealing with work, the dealing with success all dealing with injury. Like this was such an insightful conversation. And I'm so happy we had all of you on today. I'm very glad to at any time. And actually, seriously, the more publicity we can get within the company, the better, the more that people know I'm here. And particularly, you know, like I came on before ROH was part of it. So some of those people, I think, think I'm one of the boys or something. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but but seriously, the more outreach, the more connection, the better. Absolutely. I love it. Thank you, Dr. Reese, for being here. And thank you all for joining us here on AEW Unrestricted. Uh, you can catch new episodes of AEW Unrestricted every Thursday on your favorite podcast platform. We've got video episodes available every Monday on our YouTube channel. AEW Dynamite airs every Wednesday at 8 p.m. We've got AE on TBS, by the way. Uh, we've got AEW Rampage on TNT every Friday. We've got AEW Collision every Saturday on TNT. And of course, Ring of Honor is available on uh, watchroh.com on Honor Club every Thursday. Thank you all for being a part of this special episode of AEW Unrestricted. This was a phenomenal listen. Um, It was very informative for me, and I hope you got as much out of this as I did. I'm Will Washington. That's Aubrey Edwards. We'll see you next time. Have a great day. As a reminder, if you or someone you know is struggling or in a crisis, help is available 24-7. Call or text 988 or chat 988lifeline.org. Come on, throw your hands up, let me see you. Unrestricted, got the house now. We gon' turn it up, up, bring the house down. Got that big space, pump and make a